Well, thanks for having me today. Uh, my name is Rashish Pandey. I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Communications at Fortinet. Uh, Fortinet is one of the world's largest cybersecurity uh, companies. Uh, so we protect over, over 600,000 organizations, public sector, private sector across the globe. My responsibility is, is around making sure that our customers get value from their investments, that we are communicating the latest and greatest in cybersecurity innovations to our customers and partners. And last but not the least, uh, we want to make also want to make sure that the customers are fully protected from any cybersecurity threat. So that's that's the charter for me and my organization. I think cybersecurity skills shortage is an issue we've, we've dealt with many years now, and there are a couple of factors at play here, right? Uh, the first of it is the rapid digitization that started during COVID, but by the way, it's not stopping. Yeah, We are seeing actually digitization accelerate in a very meaningful manner across Southeast Asia. Every company, every country is realizing that the way to more prosperity, more growth is through digitization, right? So that trend of strong digitization is continuing. And as we digitize, more and more threat actors come in, right? Which means we need to have a stronger cybersecurity posture. What we are seeing is, uh, you know, uh, there is a major gap in skill shortage across Southeast Asia. In fact, we did a survey, a skills gap survey uh, across, you know, some of the major countries in Southeast Asia. And relatively consistent, the finding is that organizations are struggling to hire fast the right talent. Uh, to to do the security right uh, to to manage the cybersecurity investments. I think there are a couple of things to to consider here. One is the absolute capacity need, and that capacity needs keeps growing up every every year. Uh, we need we we think we are at least for example in Malaysia we are at least ten thousand people short uh, of where we need to be to have an effective uh, cybersecurity posture right. Uh, almost 90 over percent and it, between 92 to 94, depending whether it's Malaysia, Indonesia or Singapore, customers are saying, look, we've been breached and we can actually say if we had the skilled person doing this job, we wouldn't have been breached. So very high percentage at almost 90 over percent saying that, look, we could have stopped this had we had the right people. So one is the capacity problem, right? The second problem is the capability problem. Even if you have the people, are they right skilled? And it's it was one thing, you know, in the past, you could just go to a college, uh, you know, hire students and they will learn and do their job. By the time a cybersecurity student graduates today, they're already outdated because the field is moving so fast. So capability, especially ongoing education certification is something we find very important uh, across Southeast Asia and customers also realize it. Uh, almost 70 to 80 percent says that we would prefer to recruit candidate with the latest certification as against, you know, just a college degree. So I think it's a it's a growing problem. It's a problem that not one organization can fix. Uh, it's a problem where the private sector, government, academia, all of us need to come together to solve it uh, for the whole region. In the past, it used to be a narrow definition. Now, because of rapid digitization, we are seeing every sector is digitizing, right? And as soon as you digitize, you become a, a potential target of, of cyber criminals, right? That being said, I think there are a couple of clear trends that we could see. For threat actors who are motivated by financial rewards, for example, ransomware or, uh, you know, just uh, pilfering data from, from an organization and selling it out, they tend to target more critical infrastructure, for example, like financial and banking infrastructure. They will target a health infrastructure because there is an urgency to fix the issue. So organizations might pay. Uh, they tend to target manufacturing because the moment a manufacturing line is shut down, that's real loss to a company in terms of revenue. Right. So those are the big ones for financially motivated uh, threat actors, right? Banking, manufacturing, healthcare, as I spoke about, right? Now, there are non financially motivated players, for example, nation state threat actors, they have a different motivation uh, in attacking, right? And they tend to go after, for example, critical infrastructure like utilities. Uh, they would like to go after uh, things like supply chain uh, and compromising supply chain for, for, uh, for key organizations. They would like to go after critical infrastructure in the government side of things. Uh, 
So depending on the motivation, uh, we see different players going after different verticals. But in a nutshell, I don't think we can say there's any vertical today or any domain which is spared from the from uh, you know the issue of cybersecurity, right? I think everybody is exposed. Some are more exposed than the others. With cybersecurity, the, the economic impact, many, many organizations take a different take on it, right? I think World Economic Forum came out with a number $1 trillion uh, impact on cybersecurity. And that's a macro, macro number, right? And instead of the macro number, we tend to look at the micro at an organization level. What are some of the, the economic impacts that we are seeing? Right? I think uh, the first number that jumps out is, is every time you are breached, and this is a Southeast Asia number, so between Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, on an average, there's some nuances there. Every breach tends to cost a company about a million dollars. That includes recovery, that includes new systems, that includes, you know, uh, if they have to pay somebody ransomware, etc. although we never, we never advocate that. But roughly a million dollars is the cost of a breach, right? So that's one data point. The second thing you got to realize is we, in our research, we are finding every, almost every company says, we detect at least three to five breaches every year at a minimum. And that's what we detect. What we don't detect is another story, right? So you can very quickly do the maths every breach, about a million bucks, three to five, and it certainly adds up very, very rapidly, right? The other, the other non-monetary, but equally, equally important economic impact is the time to recovery. On an average, we see in Southeast Asia, the recovery times is somewhere between two to three months to fully recover from, from an attack, right? And that is opportunity cost. That's two to three months where, where your organization is not focused on where, you know, your, your regular economic activity, right? Uh, and it's not, or, or at least it's not at full stream. So both the cost of remediation as well as the opportunity cost of the time it takes to remediate, right? I think needs to add up and it kind of snowballs into a very major impact for almost all organizations who are impacted by breaches. So AI is a conversation you can't get away from, right? I think today every, every organization is talking about AI and we look at AI in a much more nuanced way, right? Uh, just like any tool when it comes out, it can be used by both good players as well as bad players. Any new technology innovation, starting from fire, by the way, uh, you know, you could use fire to cook. You can use fire for all sorts of destructive activities as well. Uh, AI is no different. I think uh, from an offensive side or from, from a threat actor perspective, AI allows them to scale attacks very quickly. AI allows them capabilities like deep fakes, uh, which takes social engineering to another uh, level, which we have never, we have never seen before, right? Uh, AI allows people to do much more sophisticated attacks than they were. AI actually reduces the threshold uh, of technical competence you might need to, to initiate an attack. You, you know, we have threat players now who you can pay money and simply initiate an AI-led attack. So I think that we see a, a, a wave of AI-led attacks coming and organization uh, need to be prepared for it. But it's not all doom and gloom, right? I think there is a very important part that AI plays on the defensive side of things or the good guy side, right? Where we fight fire with fire. So we use AI to help make our overall security posture more robust. So for example, uh, we talked about skills gap. This whole podcast has been about skills gap. We can use AI to do threat detection at a much, much faster pace than it was possible. I and mean, forget even a, a human, uh, 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 analyst, even the previous versions of threat detection software, which are now powered by AI are much better, which means if you don't have people chasing, you know, false alarms or, 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 you know, red herrings, we could have those analysts focus more on productive jobs, right? So, so they protects the overall time of the human analyst, but what AI does is it does threat detection at a very, very large scale in a much more faster, uh, manner. The other thing that AI does is it reduces the time for detection and, and, and response, right? I think we have seen, so for us, for example, by the way, a lot of people are just slapping AI on the name and suddenly, you know, 
yesterday they were a different organization today they are an ai organization uh, uh there's a lot of ai washing happening in the industry right so we need to be careful of that we've been on the ai journey for at least uh, the last 10 odd years right so our ai model is in its fifth iteration uh and what we are seeing is the more you embed ai across your system so so we have about 50 over products 40 over them have ai directly built into those those platforms right so when you have a robust sort of architecture of ai being built in instead of just bolted on like a you know llm model on top uh, it really it leads to a lot better impact right a lot better detection capabilities a lot better remediation capabilities a lot better containment policies etc right so we need to embrace ai within all our organizations but also be mindful that the adversaries are also using ai so we all need to learn about it we need to get better at it we need to start use cases and trials now so that we are prepared i think schools are doing their best to be honest uh, i think schools universities are doing their best what they are struggling with is the rapid pace of change in the cyber security landscape so number one number two uh, the curriculum which was this which was built you know 10 years ago is not really relevant anymore to the modern modern uh, uh, cyber security threat landscape right so what we suggest what we are expecting to see is one uh, we need to have more graduates who are cyber security ready today right uh, number one uh, number two we need to make sure that the the curriculum gets updated within schools as well and it's a problem that you know fortinet alone or no no entity alone can solve right but when we come together as good guys uh, and uh, you know uh, uh, defensive players we can work together so for example for us uh, we have a commitment by 2026 in 2 years time of training about a million new cyber security professionals and we are we are making good progress along those lines right but we also partner very closely with educational institutions for example in malaysia uh, you know we've got the the swiss german university uh, we've got the hang on let me just make sure i get the names right uh, we've got the sunway university uh, we also have the university science malaysia in indonesia we have gajamada universities in singapore we are tying up with with ite and other polytechnics so what we do is we share freely our content with them uh, we we train the teachers they become partners with us so that when the kids graduate or when the students graduate they are field ready and they are at the cutting edge as against you need you need to retrain them again so that's the kind of focus that we have which is first have a commitment that as a as a responsible cyber security player we have a job to protect and train and enable as many which we're going to do about a million and second very deep partnership with selected educational institutions to make sure the curriculum and the quality of the graduates is job ready